Well, one of the things that gets you into all of that kind of thing, very much like the reason I'm standing here right now, is when somebody calls you up, you say yes. And I said yes to Tom, and I've been regretting it for a number of months now, especially <laughs> the last few days. Um, especially being late in the semester, I know you guys have all heard a lot about Wisconsin Idea. Um, and it's, it's a forbidding night, probably the worst night we've had so far this season. And so I, so I really feel like I owe you something um, for coming out. And, um, but to say something new about the Wisconsin idea, hopefully I will. And hopefully uh, we can have a discussion, because I don't have an hour and 15 minutes worth of talk. So what I'm going to do initially is give you a little bit about my background. Um, Tom, Tom gave some of it, but a little bit more. Uh, about how I got here, and that, that'll bring my perspective about the Wisconsin idea along. So I have for 35 years been a faculty member in the Department of Agronomy, trying to kid Wisconsin farm boys and girls that I know about agronomy, and I'm gonna teach them about agronomy. Had to lose my accent very quickly, um, because they, to use my old accent, they laughed at me. So I had to get rid of that. Um, it was years before I said the word car because it was always vehicle because otherwise it was a really a tenuous area. I grew up in Cambridge, Mass, however, and my family's from Cambridge, Mass. And in Cambridge, Mass, they give out squares. Wherever there's the four corners of the square, and this is my dad's square, William Bill Tracy Square, Korean War veteran. And those are my two daughters. This is in East Cambridge, Mass, which is kind of where my family comes from extremely urban, extremely unlike Wisconsin agriculture. <clears throat> but my earliest memories are really loving plants. And um, I can remember going through my aunt's sub shop in East Cambridge, walking out into the, what we called the courtyard, and it was like when uh, Dorothy's house hits down in Oz, all of a sudden you go from black and white to color. And it was plants. And, uh, so ever since then, I've loved plants. Uh, then in high school, because I'm not really great at math, I took uh, advanced biology instead of, genetic, instead of um, physics, and I turned out they had a most genetics colony, which I got to manage and take care of, which was basically cleaning, cleaning cages, but I thought it was great. And this is where my love of genetics and my love of biology came together. <coughs> And uh, again, being a city kid, I didn't know you could make a living doing that, but that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years or so. Um, being a first generation college student, I went to Boston College. Um, and uh, my guidance counselor, I told my guidance counselor that I was interested in botany and, and biology. And he looked at the catalog and said, OK, BC has that. I went there. Of course, it's pre-med. Spent two years in the cafeteria playing hearts. Or hots. I'm really good at that now. Um, and then I realized I had to get out of there. And um, I found out, which I tell my undergraduates, I advise undergraduates here, <clears throat> probably three or four hundred so far in my career, I found out the secret for a great GPA. And that's transfer. Because your GPA does not follow you, the credits do. So I went from a very bad GPA at, at BC to a pretty good GPA at Madison, uh, Madison at uh, UMass Amherst. And then I got my bachelor's and master's uh, in plant science at UMass Amherst, went to Cornell and got my PhD in plant breeding. And um, then from Cornell, uh, one of the personality traits that I have is I tend to be skeptical. And in the early 80s, which is when I graduated, this is when biotechnology was really starting. Lots of um, excitement about all the things that biotechnology was going to do for us. I literally have articles in my files uh, where they're talking about pork chops on trees. It was going to change the world. Uh, this kind of stuff out there like that now. Isn't that, that incredible burger or something like that? That's kind of similar. Um, so I went to California, my first job. And San Francisco, lovely place to, to live. And uh, worked with this company for nine months. And then they ran out of money because they couldn't do anything that they claimed. Hunted around for a job and talk about culture shock. I went from San Francisco to Grinnell, Iowa. 
Um, the only restaurant, as I recall, that was open on Sunday was Arby's. Um, it was a pretty tough transition. But then fate looked upon me, and I ended up here. Um, I couldn't imagine a better place to be, especially as a plant scientist, plant breeder, plant geneticist. Um, I've been in the Department of Agronomy for 35 years. Um, I was hired to teach Agronomy 100 and to do research on sweet corn. That's one of my crews two or three summers ago out in the field. Uh, it's been a great career and I've really enjoyed it. And I think part of the reason I've enjoyed it so much is the Wisconsin idea, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, I've done outreach to farmers and seed companies. You'll see up in the left there. I've done a lot of work with K, uh, K-5 education, did a corn in the classroom thing for about 15 years with a bunch of kids. Those are kids from DeForest School District. I've worked with uh, the Oneida Nation on, on corn breeding with them. That's been very rewarding. And the most rewarding thing of all is having roughly 50 graduate students uh, get their degrees under me. Uh, it's been really fabulous. Except for the grad students, most of my bosses are administrators. Well, first of all, I'll back up. At Wisconsin, well, most of my administrators have never known that I'd done any of that. So you might consider that the Wisconsin idea. Um, the backup part was my, my uh, daughter, and this again, I think, goes to the Wisconsin idea. My daughter, kindergarten, five years old, came home from school, and I'm sure she had a charge from her teacher, ask your parents what they do for a living, who do they work for? And she came home, Mara came home and said, Daddy, who's your boss? And I thought for a minute and I said, the people of Wisconsin. And I really believe that. The way shared governance of this institution worked, or at least I think it still works this way, is I don't have a boss. I have the people of Wisconsin that I have to answer to. Also, um, I've developed sweet corn that's grown on every continent except for Antarctica. I am working on that. Um, got some friends in Ice Cube. Maybe we can get down there somehow. As Tom said, I've been department chair of agronomy for 15 years. I was interim dean of the College of Ag and Life Sciences for 14 years. 14 years. 14 months. Um, spent a lot of time in Bascom Hall. Uh, I was on uh, the university committee for four years, chair for one year and then president of profs for four years. Profs is the public re representation of the faculty senate. Spent a lot of time in that role at the Capitol. Um, stopped that about six or seven years ago because it didn't really seem rewarding uh, given what was going on at the Capitol. This is being streamed, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, so let's get down to Wisconsin. Um, UW-Madison was founded in 1848. Um, it, the first class began in 1849. I think it's really important to think about this because we often talk about UMass, UMass UW-Madison as a land-grant university. It was started by the people of Wisconsin at least 13 years before the Land-Grant Act happened. It was a state university, very progressive in that sense. The people at that time uh, wanted to have a university to educate their mostly young men at that time. And uh, it was created that way. I looked at some of the founding documents and they're really kind of hard to see and I'm not ever quite sure whether they're really the founding documents or something that, you know, uh, a, an addition or an amendment later on. But one of the things that I did find in one of the very early documents is the founding of the university forbid any secular education. So no religious education could be part of this institution. Um, in 1862, uh, the Morrill Act uh, was, was signed. And uh, the Morrill Act was the land-grant uh, college act. And um, this is a picture of the North Woods uh, at that time. Uh, before the land grant, and this is a person here. So this is what the pine tree, the white pine trees used to look like in the first old growth forests. And um, so what the land grant act was, was a, a deed of land 
given to each state, which could then be sold for, um, to raise money to create a college. And interestingly, uh, and you can read this, uh, obviously I wasn't there, so I had to read it as well, so it's out there somewhere in the literature. Our legislators, surprisingly enough, did not handle this grant very well. They let it go for pennies on the dollar. And anyone want to guess who they let it go to? Famous name in universities. Big competitor of our university. They sold the land grant to Ezra Cornell for pennies on the dollar, and Ezra Cornell made his fortune and then went and founded Cornell University. Um, so surprisingly, the Wisconsin legislature made a mistake back then. Um, and uh, they also debated about where the land grant was going to go. There was, Ripon College was very seriously a possibility for the land grant. And it came to Madison. I will make another aside here that my home state, Massachusetts, uh, which is, I think, still the number one or perhaps only state where more students go to private colleges than public colleges, Massachusetts did not have any public colleges when the land grant occurred. And they actually split their land grant and gave half of it, or I don't even know whether it was half or not, but they gave a portion to the new Mass Agricultural College, and they gave the other portion to MIT. So MIT is a land-grant university. Um, and uh, so let me read you the words here of the Morrill Act, or not the whole thing. Uh, the money could be used to the endowment, support, and maintenance of at least maintenance of at least one college where the leading object shall be to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the individual classes on the, sever classes on the several pursuits and professions of life. So it was really to provide college to the uh, people, the working people, the farmers, the tradesmen. Prior to that, mostly it was the upper class people that went to university. <clears throat> so there's three parts to what we think of as a land-grant university. When Lincoln signed the Land-Grant Act in 1862, they thought it was one part, which was an educational college. Uh, in 18... 87, the Hatch Act was signed. And the Hatch Act, again I'll read, was to found state agricultural experiment stations. The object and the duty of the state agricultural experiment station is to conduct original and other researches, investigations, and experiments bearing directly on and contributing to the establishment and maintenance of a permanent and effective agricultural industry. So this was creating uh, an agricultural infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure to do agricultural research. And this infrastructure still exists today. Uh, furthermore, the, the Act says, the development and improvement of the rural home and rural life and the maximum contribution by agriculture to the welfare of the consumer. So this was the founding of the research part of UW-Madison. Um, UW-Madison probably, well, at some point, maybe 50 or 60 years later, might have gotten into research, but this was what started the research efforts in earnest. Um, this is the old dairy barn, which still exists here on campus. Um, and I will say, as an aside, again, to, to offer some of my perspective, this created, surprise, a federal act, this created a large bureaucracy um, which, which is now called the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And this large bureaucracy has lots of committees, as you might imagine. And as a result of that, I've served on many, many committees for many other universities. I've reviewed half a dozen, at least, other universities and their, uh, their experiment stations. And there's a lot of interaction among, especially ag faculty, that way. The third piece of the Land Grant Act no, the third piece of the land grant university was the creation of a cooperative extension. <clears throat> now, cooperative extension had started under Charles Van Heist somewhere in the early 1900s, maybe 1907 or something. Extension by that I mean extending the campus knowledge uh, 
produced by prof professors out to, the, out to the state. While Van Heist had that idea, many, many other people had that idea. And in, eight, in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act was, in, it was uh, created. And actually, this is E.L. Luther, 1912, on his motorized Indian motorcycle. That was the name of the, the brand of motorcycle. And he was the first extension agent in Wisconsin's history. And he was before the, the, uh, the Smith-Lever Act. And if I can, just a couple of paragraphs about Smith-Lever. In order to aid in diffusing among the people of the United States useful and practical information on subjects relating to agriculture, home economics, and rural energy, and to encourage the application of the same. Cooperative agricultural extension shall work uh, to consist of the development of practical applications of research knowledge and giving of instruction and practical demonstrations of existing or improved practices or technologies in agriculture, uses of solar energy with respect to agriculture. I don't know how else you would have used solar energy then, but that was um, with uses uh, with respect to agriculture. Home economics, rural energy, and subjects relating um, to persons not attending or resident in said colleges and communities. So these three pieces, the Morrill Act, the Hatch Act, and the Smith-Lever Act really created what we would consider the modern land-grant university. And that's really important when we start to think about the Wisconsin idea. So what is the Wisconsin idea? Um, I actually taught a class this afternoon, and I asked the students, what is the Wisconsin idea? And some of them looked a little nervous. Um, most of them raised their hands, not all of them. Uh, or at first I asked if they knew it, knew about it. Not all of them raised their hands. I asked the ones who did, I said, do you know what it is? And one of them came up with an answer somewhat like this. Uh, the boundary, well, I don't, I'm not going to read what's already up there. Um, and if you ask most people on the street in Madison, that's probably what they'd say. Um, to which I would say, and I've said, and this is why I set the whole thing up. I'm not a Midwesterner. I never heard about the land grant, uh, the, um, I did hear about the land grant because I went to UMass Amherst. I never heard about the Wisconsin idea until I got here. So I wasn't raised in it. So when somebody said this to me, I said, what does that mean? Don't all universities do that? As far as I know, all land grant universities do something like that. Oh, by the way, this is a map. This is kind of a Wisconsin idea thing. This is a map uh, prepared recently by my colleague in soil science, the chair of soil science, Alfred Hardemink. Beautiful new book on the soils and geology of Wisconsin. So uh, it's, it's, it's an academic book, but it's pretty enough that you could use it as a coffee table book. And Alfred is not going to give me any royalties for telling you that. Um, somebody with a little more sophistication might talk about President Charles uh, Van Heys. 1905, he said, uh, well, again, I'm not going to read what he said. Um, it's a beautiful statement. It's something that we all support. Again, it would be hard for me to imagine the president of Ohio State or Michigan or, which isn't, by, way, by the way, uh, land grant, or, uh, um, or Illinois or Berkeley, not saying something like that. So if you go to the website, the Wisconsin Idea website on the UW-Madison website, you get this, all of these impacts. Uh, and we're really good at impacts. UW-Madison, I'm very proud to be here. We do a lot of things very well. Uh, and interestingly, the website does talk about these things that I've talked about, uh, Van Heys and the legislative uh, issues and things like that. Um, but it actually, at the very end of the statement, says this. It basically says, well, we really don't consider that the uh, land grant anymore. Um, we really talk about the com university's commitment to public service. Again, what major state university would not say that? It's inconceivable to me that Texas A&M or University of Texas or North Carolina mm -hmm. State would say anything like that. I will point out, since this is pretty big, 
that um, research rankings, uh, fourth research expenditures among US universities in 2013. Uh, here it says public or private ranked, uh, the only university ranked in the top five for research in each of the last 25 years. When I was interim dean, I would, when I was recruiting a new faculty member, I would tell them how great we were. And I would cite those numbers. And I would sit in my desk, maybe after they left, and I'd say, I don't want to be sitting in this chair when I can't say that anymore. We can't say that anymore. We can't say it because of the cuts that this university has taken over the last 12 years. I'll go back to Governor Doyle, but we cannot say that anymore. We have dropped, we were in the top five for 44 years, as long as the statistics were taken until, I don't know whether it was 2016 or 2017 or maybe 2015. So um, I believe I got this off the website right just the other day, so they're still citing 2013 figures here. Uh, and that really hurts me. Um, again, I'm very, despite all that stuff about Massachusetts and stuff, I'm very proud to be here and, and this is, um, this is easily, uh, you can attribute this to simply the number of faculty who left and the size of the grants that they took with them when they left. So that's the way we frame the University of the Wisconsin idea. Um, but again, like I said, any other university, any other major research university, land-grant university, would, would claim all of those same things. And I guess the question I want to pose to you folks is do we do the Wisconsin idea justice when we say that? Then we say that's what it is. Um, even if the current winds tell us to say that, is that are we doing the folks who actually, or was there even a Wisconsin idea originally? I mean, I haven't gotten to that point, but maybe there wasn't. Maybe this is somebody just a good ad, a PI guy, somebody from the School of Business said, Wisconsin idea. That's what we're going to do. Sell it. Um, do we uh, do our intellectual ancestors, do we do our ancestors themselves justice by saying this mishy mashy thing is the Wisconsin idea? Um, and do we do ourselves justice for the future as, as a great university? What happens when we do what we've done? So I was looking for the hook for this talk, okay? Last night I'm working on this talk. It's like, what's going to happen with this talk? Go to Twitter. You can always find something on Twitter. So go to Twitter and I find this. The University of Wisconsin Stevens Point News Bulletin, actually on Wisconsin Public Radio. Uh, the University of Stevens Point, November 12, 2018, says that the University of Stevens Point is eliminating six, major, six majors in the humanities to address a budget sh shortfall. Campus officials said budget issues sparked the change and the university will be better positioned to respond to changing higher education trends. Our sister universities around the state, meaning sisters to UW-Madison, have suffered far more than we have. Um, we have ways, we've suffered a lot, but we have ways of raising uh, revenue. We've raised revenue on out-of-state students quite a bit. Um, increasing summer revenue, increasing the number of students from Wisconsin who come here. Um, when we do that, places like Stevens Point have fewer students, and fewer students who are actually going to graduate in a timely fashion. And then their statistics are going to go down, and somebody in the legislature is going to be mad at them because they're not doing as well as they're supposed to be doing. So I'm not mad at these folks, but when you see what they did to the Wisconsin idea, they said that they're creating two new entities, one called the Institute of Wisconsin Idea and the other one the Center for Critical Thinking. And this is what Provost Summers said the Institute for the Wisconsin Idea is. A cross-disciplinary program focusing on ensuring liberal arts education is melded into all degree programs on campus. Is that the Wisconsin Idea? I mean, is 
Um, the other things I showed the Wisconsin idea, I don't, I think this is what happens when we kind of just say, oh, whatever, whatever looks good on a, on a spread, on a, on a uh, web page. But this is like the absolute conversion of the Wisconsin idea. The Wisconsin idea was supposed to be um, taking campus out to the, to the state and not, um, or taking campus out to the state, taking the knowledge generated on campus out to make the state better. So if we peel all this apart, it's very clear, and some people don't want to talk about this. Over the last eight years, we can see why people don't want to talk about it. Maybe things will change over the next four years, a little bit anyway. The Wisconsin idea is clearly rooted in Wisconsin's progressive era. And it's a partnership, no question, between the university and the state government. This was in a book called something like, and I wish I had the exact thing, I could find it in five minutes on the computer, uh, The Way the World Works, or something like this. So this was articles all, all over the world. And one of the articles was a university that runs a state. <clears throat> How Wisconsin State University writes many of its laws, directs much of its public service, here comes my part, increases the crops, makes better farmers, and I like this, it makes also better housewives. I'd like to investigate that a little bit more. Uh, correspondence courses and carries a college education to the door of every citizen who wants it. This is what the Wisconsin idea was. Actually, I would stop it really at the, after the public service because the rest of it is what cooperative, cooperative extension is about. It's clearly a partnership between the university and the state government. <clears throat> and to shift a little bit here, to talk about why uni the University of Wisconsin-Madison is truly a great university. I believe one of the greatest in the country. Our rankings go up and down, but there's something special about this place. And I knew it was special after being here for four or five years. And I'll get into that in a bit. It's different from any place else I've been. And I've been at a lot of universities. Uh, so what's different about it? What is special about it? And what's special about it is not the Wisconsin idea. The Wisconsin idea is part of what's special about it. What's really special about it is the progressive era. We all know this statement. Um, the sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. What beautiful language. But what's even more important is the words in front of that, the continual and fearless sifting and winnowing. That's what we all do here. And we have this nail to the front of Bascom Hall. And it means a tremendous amount. But it's part of this progressive era. And I can tell you, I mean, the University of Illinois didn't have a progressive era. Um, I don't know about Michigan. Certainly, North, uh, certainly many of the other universities did not have the progressive era that we had in this state. Um, now, I don't know, and, and the reason I had some trepidation about talking to you tonight is I don't know what else you've heard. You've, ha you've had a number of these talks, and um, I've been doing reading, there's some conflict, but I'm pretty confident in what I at least want to tell you, whether it's absolutely true or not, um, maybe questionable. But um, I'm really persuaded by the article by David Hovler. Did you guys have somebody discuss that with you already? Um, the University and the Social Gospel, the Intellectual Origins of the Wisconsin Idea. We usually give the Wisconsin, credit for the Wisconsin Idea to Charles Van Heist, which is the top picture in the middle there. Um, of course, Bob LaFollette, not a university faculty, but a major player in the progressive uh, major, major player, the biggest probably uh, uh, player in the progressive era. Um, governor of Wisconsin, senator for many years, ran for president. And, uh, but they were students of the man on the left, which is John Bascom. And um, John Bascom, at least as Hubler describes it, uh, he's a historian, I'm really just using his words and his, his research but I'm going to read um, 
some, some words directly from Havler and some of them directly from Bascom and a few from La Follette. So Havler says Bascom described for his students an age he judged to be destructive in its power. So this is the late 1880s, early 1990s. Robber Baron era, uh, the, the railroads um, were running roughshod over, over the citizens. Um, a ruthlessly competitive society with aggregated power in the hands of a few individuals. Does that sound familiar? I don't know. Uh, he also said, uh, again, another quote from Hovler, such an arrangement of forces, according to Bascom, was unethical and unchristian in nature and ultimately debilitating to society as a whole. When Bascom therefore called for harmonious power as the truest expression of beneficent power, remember Van Heys talks about the beneficent power going out to the, um, to, to the citizens of the state. Uh, remember Van Heys was uh, Bascom's student. Um, Bascom turned directly to the state, the agency of public power for its exercise. The state, Baskin wrote in his textbook, Sociology, must create social power, surpassing the work of isolated individuals. Furthermore, the state must give power to the weaker elements in, the, in its midst, a concern that, most, uh, that suffused most of the reform measures that Baskin endorsed. Baskin was, in fact, making an important modification of the evangelical format. He now turned to the state as a surrogate of churches. Uh, modern America could no longer rely on these institutions for the perfection of the nation. In fact, many of them have been co-opted by the money power. Finally, on the basis, on the issue of the rights of labor and unionization, John Bascom took an, unstand, an uncommon stand for the usual college president. In the 1880s, he was in favor of worker unionization. This is the next thing means a lot to me because I really do think this infuses uh, the spirit of many of us in this, in, on this campus, many of us in this city. Um, and again, it's kind of been beat out of us a little bit over the last few years, but Bascom was a spiritual optimist who never doubted that the improvement of the world was the ordained order of things. He thought things would get better. Um, Direct quote from Bascom, the money power vigorously asserts itself and it easily overawes the moral and social forces which should work against it. Not only was it imperative that intellectual and moral power become a concern of the state, the state university must itself be the institutional epitome of that power. Sounds like he had, he never used the words Wisconsin idea. Sounds like he was kind of on the track there though. And um, I think just a couple more from Bascom. But if this were true, then there could be no, caller high in, high, no higher calling in life than service to the state in some capacity. Remember, La Follette was his student. As La Follette later recalled about his training under Bascom at Wisconsin, this is a quote from La Follette now, he was forever telling us what the state was doing for us and urging our return obligation or not, for our own, not for our own selfish benefit, but to return some service to the state. And then the final quote, maybe, I'm not sure, I might have another one. The time will come and public administration will fa hasten it in which educational men will gather influence within their own field and become the servants of the state to counsel action as well as to carry it out. So Bascom stepped down in the early 1890s, I think. I'm not sure of exactly the date. Uh, among the people, and I didn't have time to track this down, unfortunately, but R.T. Ely um, on the lower picture, he was the one that the sifting and winnowing statement was um, uh, drafted for. The state public superintendent wanted him fired for his socialist leanings and um, the Board of Regents came up with that statement. Ely was also a very, well, as his socialist leanings might tell you, he was a very progressive person, uh, came up with a lot of progressive policies. The guy in the right there is John Commons, and he was a, um, 
economist, I believe, and um, he came up with um, worker compensation, social security, uh, many of the New Deal policies under FDR were Commons work. And they were hired in, after, I believe, Bascom retired, but certainly Bascom's influence was there. Um, a little bit more from Hubler's book. By 1907, 41 faculty members were serving the state on one or more commissions. The perfection of this arrangement owed much to Ely and to John R. Commons, whom Ely brought to Wisconsin in 1904. I believe Ely said, we regard the state as an educational ethical agency whose positive aid is an indispensable condition of human progress. And then furthermore, Common said, uh, specifically government must enforce shorter hours for labor, preserve the Sabbath as protection from for forced work, write new factory laws for women and children, abolish sweatshops, and require better wages and greater security of unemployment. Uh, he did add on there that then it will be possible to have universal prohibition. <laughs> he was, uh, I don't know what we would, would have done with our Sundays, but um, he was, uh, he, uh, these, these men were incredibly progressive um, and really created a lot of what we now consider uh, the laws and the life that we have in this country. Um, I don't know if I want to say anything about those folks right now. Charles McCarthy, for those of you my age or older, not the ventriloquist dummy, but the actual Charles McCarthy, wrote a book entitled The Wisconsin Idea. That's the first written Wisconsin Idea in 1912. Um, and... Uh, Again, to reinforce what the Wisconsin idea was really all about, uh, President Roosevelt, not to reinforce it, but uh, for, for me to read the statement which reinforces it, President Roosevelt wrote the foreword. Wisconsin has become literally a laboratory for wise experimental legislation aiming to secure the social and political betterment of the people as a whole. Charles McCarthy also, I believe, founded, but certainly served for a very long time, in the Legislative Reference Bureau at the Capitol. So when legislators needed information, he would be the one who could provide it. And I believe that uh, that service still exists today. So, and I don't have, oh, I do have the quote here. In 1995, in the Wisconsin Blue Book, which comes out from the Wisconsin legislature, there was a major, and I spent a lot of time reading this, a major exposition uh, writing on the Wisconsin idea. I believe his name was Stark who wrote that. Um, it's obviously on my computer. And um, by then, there was a revision of the Wisconsin idea. By then, we, they didn't want to talk, even in the 1990s, which we didn't think were quite so regressive as other times. Uh, by the 1990s, uh, he was dismissing Bascom and he was dismissing McCarthy, saying, oh, well, that was just kind of crazy stuff that happened in the Progressive Era. And um, Stark said that McCarthy thought of the ideas as, uh, as various ameliorative activities of the Wisconsin pro Progressive Movement, including those at the university, but then really dismissed this whole thing. So there's been revisionist history to this for a long time. Um, there was immediate revisionist history when the conservative so-called stalwart Republicans took over in the late 19 teens or early 20s. And um, so there's been revisionist history about this. But like I po uh, posed at the beginning, or a bit ago, shouldn't we just accept the history? I mean, are we doing ourselves any good by making it less offensive to somebody? Uh, are we doing uh, the memory of these men any good? Well, Wisconsin, as I said, I think is an exceptional place. Again, you could go to any of our uh, land grants around the country and come up with a list of people. Um, uh, but there's something I believe is special about Wisconsin, and this is just a tiny, uh, tiny section of people, mostly from my college, because I know my college better. And I figured if I put somebody up from another college, 
I wouldn't have put the most important person up, so I just picked my people, except for Margaret Dobler, who was the only woman that I could find, although she was hired in 1906. And, um, and two women's dorms were built in 1901 and 1910 or something like that. So again, during the progressive era, those, those dorms occurred. This is Ari Brink. He brought hybrid corn to Wisconsin. He also bred the most important uh, alfalfa variety in history. Uh, Ari Moore, uh, my building is named after Moore. He was a extension uh, educator who was involved in what we call short course. Um, he was one of the early grain breeders in Wisconsin. Uh, he actually had a World War II ship named after him, so he, somebody must have liked him. Um, Loring Jones, he was a uh, plant pathologist. He brought modern plant pathology to the University of Wisconsin and hired a lot of very important people. Of course, you all know Aldo Leopold, the land ethic, and um, again, the kind of things these people did, I'm, even though I'm sure every other university could come up with a list of such people, I'm not sure every university could come up with the kind of things that they did. Leopold was a revolutionary. F.H. King was a revolutionary. Um, F.H. King became the Secretary of Agriculture after being here, and unfortunately, either he resigned or died. Either, either one was unfortunate for us because he would have changed agriculture in this country if he had remained in that role. Um, Dean Henry, uh, Russell, and Babcock, again, all people who were rocking the boat. And then this is W.D. Horde, who was not a faculty member. He is an, an answer to a trivia question, though. Uh, but W.D. Horde was the governor of the state and a big promoter of the dairy industry. Does anyone know the trivia question that W.D. Horde is the answer to? Who's the statue on Henry Mall? Most people say Henry, but it's W.D. Horde. So make a bet next time you're walking around Henry Mall. Um, but these people were all special. They were all revolutionaries. They weren't, they weren't just doing what they were supposed to do. So UW-Madison is perennially ranked high in the list of universities that produce the top number of C uh, CEOs. That's actually a headline. Uh, I think five years ago, or maybe seven years ago now, was number two after Harvard. Uh, this it was in the top 10. Almost always, UW-Madison is ranked first in the number of Peace Corps volunteers. Um, we, we probably are historically the number one in Peace Corps volunteers. As you know, we have a history of um, civic activism in various ways. Um, and then we are, despite my talking about problems with research, we are very um, successful, kind of we punch above our weight in, in research. So what do all four of these things require? What do all four of these things require? What kind of person is going to do any of those things? Committed. Committed. Passionate. Passionate. I would say an optimist. I would say somebody who is empowered, somebody who thinks they can do it. You're not going to do that stuff if you think you're not going to make a change. CEOs definitely think, I'm going to be the successful CEO. CEO. Kids who go to the Peace Corps are not going to say, they're not saying, well, I'm just going to go for a couple of weeks in the jungles of Nigeria. Uh, these people think they're going to be successful. The empowerment, and this is what I've been leading up to, the progressive era empowered folks on this campus and this community. Madison still holds on to this. I mean, everyone complains about how hard it is to get a new road built or a new street light on your street. Well, that's actually because people are empowered. I mean, they're like, well, I don't know if I like that street light on your street. Um, I think we should welcome that. Welcome the empowerment of the people in this community. I've never been in a community that's as empowered as this. I'll give you an, an anecdote. Um, so, as I said, I've been on a lot of committees around the country and around the world. And um, I was on a committee that's called the NC1. That's the North Central One Committee. That's the first committee that the USDA set up around the North Central region. Uh, going back to the Hatch Act. And um, 
The NC1 is for the Department of Agronomy or Crop Science Chair. So once a year we get together and the idea, of course, is we're supposed to share problems and solve problems. And so I, um, as a new chair, uh, 14 years ago or so, I went to this meeting and it came to the state reports. And we ran around the state reports and you can imagine, any of you have been in any kind of meeting, you can imagine what the state reports People were bitching. Oh, they're cutting our budget. We don't have enough students. We don't have enough staff. We don't have this or that. And we went around 12 people saying the same thing and everybody complaining. I went back the second year, exactly the same thing. So the third year I go back and I'm sitting somewhere in the middle of the 12. Halfway around the circle it comes to me and I said, look it, we are the leaders of the major crop science departments in the country probably of the world. We should, we all have the same problems. We should be figuring out how to solve the problems. We shouldn't be talking about them. We should figure out how to solve the problems. I was met with dead silence, absolutely dead silence. And then I said, well, I passed because it doesn't do me any good for you to know my problems. So after the meeting or after that break, after, the, after I said that, went around the table and went onto the corridor. And after that, two different chairs of the leading universities, of the leading crop science departments. And they each came up to me and separately and grabbed my coat and said, I really agreed with you. I mean, were we bugged? Was there some kind of drone <laughs> flying over the room that their dean would find out that they were disgruntled? Um, but I do think that's, it's just a story, but that's the empowerment of Madison. Madison people don't, if, if, if we can fix something, we're going to. And that goes back to my point about the optimism that, um, that Bascom talked about, or that was, that Hovler talked about Bascom being. Question? It's more, so when I hear you talking about this, you're talking about the culture, too, and the culture that impacts the faculty interactions. Right. So I'm, I'm a faculty grad of uh, a radiation biologist, cancer researcher here. And he talked about when he was out, um, out I'll, I'll just say it in general, out east, that if he walked into another person's laboratory, they would close their lab notebooks before they would uh, say, may I help you? Right. He said when he got his PhD here at UW Madison before going out there and why he wanted to come back <laughs> be on the faculty here, which fortunately he did. Um, he said it was the exact opposite of that. You would walk in, what do you need? What can I share with you? So there's a culture that, that I'm hearing you talk about. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons we've held on to, during the tough times we had three or four years ago, uh, we held on to more people than, we, than other places would have because of that culture. People knew about the culture. Um, I'll, um, I've got something coming up on this, but I'll, I'll jump ahead of it. But this culture thing, because um, I don't want to forget it. So I've, I've been recruited to a number of other places. And um, I had been recruited to another university. I won't mention their name. And um, I had gotten tenure here just before they recruited me. And I had gone to this meeting, or not the meeting, to the recruitment. And, and it looked like a good deal. I was very interested. And the, um, the chair says, well, we'll hire you, but without tenure. And I was like, I just got tenure at Madison. And, and I didn't say, and I know Madison's way better than you, but I, <laughs> that would have been impolitic. Um, so I just said, that seems crazy. And he said to me, don't worry. No faculty member who I've ever want, wanted to get tenure hasn't gotten tenure. So he was saying he was king of the department, and as long as I was his friend, I would be fine. And that brings up actually my next. So anyway, I think the culture, but the culture is largely empowerment. Um, there is a very collaborative sense here, although we do have faculty members who are less so, but uh, that's part of it. It does really bring up my next slide, and that is, um, we have a very, oh, we, I have you and Chad in the picture. <laughs> we have a very strong shared governance here. Um, faculty Senate up there, the faculty govern. So we have shared governance, but we also have different 
parts of that. We have faculty governance, and that was, I think, during the vote of no confidence. Um, an entertaining meeting. Um, and then we have the Academic Staff Institute. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of people meeting together as academic staff. Um, recently, we've created the university staff shared governance. That's the old classified staff, the unionized staff. And once Walker took away the unionization, uh, we gave them, as they deserved, a, a, a part of governance, and then Associated Students of Madison. This empowers all of these people to be actively involved in decision making and um, involvement. Um, this does not leave out administrators. Administrators are part of this. Uh, uh, we work with our administrator. I mean, all of these organizations give input to the administrators. And, the, and in some cases, the administrators actually will negotiate with these various bodies to, to come to a good uh, conclusion. What I want to say here, though, and I think it relates somewhat to your point, just talking about faculty governance, um, we often think of the Senate, and most people kind of moan about the Senate, oh, the Senate. I have to spend an hour and a half a month at the Senate. It's like, it's really not a big deal. Come on, go to the Senate. But I um, feel like not much happens at the Senate. Uh, but what's very interesting about our system, and it goes to this empowerment, especially for faculty, is that our faculty policies and procedures, which again, I believe, were totally written with a progressive mindset, the faculty policy and procedures basically say a couple of things that are very important. One is that the chairs must be elected by the faculty every year. And um, I was mindful of that. I, I enjoyed being chair. I didn't want to, you know, if I had tough decisions to make, I'd have to negotiate them rather than managing by edict. Um, and so basically in our system, which I don't know of any other system, the chair represents the faculty to the dean. In almost every other university that I know of, the dean is, the chair is the dean's representative to the faculty, which really creates some problems. Um, one of our major colleges does not follow the same rules in faculty policies and procedures always, but that's faculty policies and procedures. The other thing is, and again, having been chair for a long time, faculty policies and procedures give the chair no power. The chair chairs the meeting, that's it. The executive committee of the faculty controls resources. The executive committee of the faculty controls uh, hiring. Everything is in the hands of the executive committee of the faculty. Now, the executive committee of the faculty can delegate things, we don't have to go into that. But the chair is really chairs the meeting and hopefully facilitates a good environment. Um, something I was gonna say about that. Um, Oh, at other institutions, and I know cases of this at other institutions, where an assistant professor has done something that the chair didn't like, the chair has said, I'm taking your greenhouse space away, or I'm taking your technician away, or you have to teach an extra course this semester. That's, that's the way other places work. In the vast majority of the colleges and departments that I know on this campus, that could not happen. Those assistant professors are allowed to maximize their creativity, and this goes to your point about the culture. I, I call that empowerment, but the point is, is our system uh, gives the, 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 everyone on this campus, and I know that th there, there's a hierarchy, but at least, uh, at least among the faculty, um, it's up to you to be as creative as possible, and no one's gonna tell you to stop that, or say they don't like it. Um, so, my point being that the, the Wisconsin idea was really about, it wasn't about getting your cows to produce more milk or having somebody balance their checkbook or something like that. It was really about social policy. And this campus is one of the leaders, and again, I'm not an expert in this, but one of the leaders in social policy. And I just picked a few examples of the kind of things that are being discussed on this campus that could inform uh, the legislature if they wish to. I have no doubt that Tony Evers will actually talk to people about some of these kind of things. Whether they ever become law, I don't know. But I have no doubt that we at least have somebody who's gonna to listen to this. 
Um, I will point out the one up in the upper right. We have the Applied Population Lab on campus here in, the UW, in UW Madison. It's housed in the Community um, Department of Community Environmental Sociology, and uh, or as Kami Soci as they like to be called, and they are in um, in Ag Hall. And this is a small unit, maybe three or four people, three or four scientists who study population growth and or changes or demographic changes. And um, they 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 publish they, they they put out some very interesting stuff. Here you see that uh, some of these counties, um, oh gee, Waukesha, Washington, Ozaki counties, decreasing in population. Maybe that's good. Can you cut that out of the? Um, <laughs> Ain County and, and Milwaukee and Brown County going up. Okay. Um, this organization, when I was dean, looking for places to cut, I was like, what do these people do? Why do we have them? <clears throat> and I was told, this was 2011, we have them because the state wants us to have this unit so they can use the, these folks' scientific information in what? Redistricting. This is 2011. Did they do anything in 2020? Uh, did, were they ever asked the question in 2011 or 2010 during the redistricting? No, there was a high price law firm down in uh, Capitol Square that did their job. So we have the social policy here and people still do it. And we are one of the leaders. Our sociology department for many, many years, I hope it still is, I haven't seen the statistics in a long time, for many years was the number one sociology department in the country. Economics is a fabulous department. We do social policy here, and a lot of this could actually, um, could be used to make a better society. I recommend, I recognize the, the issues that Becky Blank has um, in terms of negotiating the politics downtown. I recognize that maybe waving the flag that the Wisconsin idea is, is the best thing ever um, may be a little difficult, but I don't think we should redefine the Wisconsin idea. I think we should talk about the Wisconsin idea. I think we should talk about what it is and what makes us great. And if we can't use it now, maybe that diminishes us a bit, but just redefining it as cooperative extension does not do us or our ancestors our intellectual ancestors, any good. And with that, on Wisconsin, I'd be happy to take any questions. I was curious about your reference at the front end of the uh, Oneida Nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you found that experience and what takeaways for you and for them? Well, um, that actually came about because I was doing this K-5 education thing. And a group of Oneida teachers from the Turtle School, their elementary school, came here. And because um, I was teaching corn in the classroom. And of course, corn is very important in their culture. So um, that's how we made that connection. And then I went up to Turtle School. I think I taught at the school three or four times. And then I also connected with their organic farm, Junhenkwa. And it was very re rewarding. Um, like most things, there needs to be some level of funding. And um, I stretched things out as far as I could. But at some point, I didn't have the resources to continue it. We have a good, I, I, I believe we have a very good relationship. And uh, um, it, it was a very rewarding time. We, I, I learned a ton. Come on, I said something contrary. <laughs> so so you, you talked about optimism as being a, a key feature, and, and I hadn't really thought about that. I'm still processing, but boy, that sure fits with what I know of a lot of people on campus. What is your perspective of the sort of the character of the faculty on this campus um, with respect to optimism, uh, with respect to looking outward, in particular, why did people tend to stay here when they may have been able to get better offers for if they were if they were made better offers than a lot of other places? You mentioned we didn't lose as many people as we otherwise would have. So 
So, so what, do you see that optimism as being sort of a key feature, or are there some other features, some other characteristics that you see being widespread? Well, I would say the culture. I mean, it's, you know, maybe that helps with the optimism or keeps the optimism there, but having a culture of sharing, a culture of, um, of uh, I mean, this, what I'm talking about in terms of the empowerment does not exist. Tom, you've been other places. It, no, it doesn't exist anywhere, and that can drag you down. And uh, I, we've, we've seen a number of people go elsewhere and then come back. Um, and uh, I, think, I think this the culture, I, and this is what was so particularly harmful in the, what, the 2011, 2014 period is that, um, you know, Governor Doyle made big cuts, we get that, but he never disliked us. He never said, you guys are horrible or you you're, don't deserve what you're getting. It's the lack of respect that we, I think most of the people we lost were because of, they felt disrespected. But um, I think the optimism is very important and, um, I mean, because as you know, most of the time the research doesn't actually go the way you thought it would, so optimism is really important in a lot of ways. So. Yeah? I was just wondering what your viewer discussion here would be about the way the, uh, with Foxconn moving in and donating research money to get patent back what kind of impact does that have on him? Um, yeah, there, there's concern about that, I think, among the faculty. You know, I think, because I was going around in a circle, I left off Steenbach, who was in the middle of that picture. And he's standing in front of Wharf, or at least the early version of Wharf, it says right there. And I can tell you this, that um, there were a number of faculty, I think I can say his name, Hector DeLuca, who is a, his name's <laughs> the whole block across the street named after him. Uh, he was very, very upset when the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery were created. And the reason he was upset is that Wharf's charter said that could only be used to support UW-Madison research. And they changed the charter so that they could build that institute. And so I think that same kind of um, concern exists with, with Foxconn. I mean, it's not the same exact kind of deal, but, you know, the, the and I'm sure Wharf is concerned because Wharf um, wants the patents as well as Foxconn. So there was probably some very ticklish negotiations there. Yeah? So, you know, when I've heard, you know, people talk about the history of the Wisconsin idea of progressive era, and, you know, some of the, these phrases that come out, it, it's kind of shocking how some of these things are just totally off of the, the term social gospel. Mm -hmm. Just even discussing that, like what's important for society, is just that discussion at any type of level is kind of just off the table. Everything is couched as, you know, individual. What's ideas. most efficient? Pardon? What's most efficient? Right, right, right. Or just, it's always, well, it's efficient to be we have this ultimate individual entrepreneurship. There's never been, what does society want or need? That's off the table. Yeah, I, yeah there's no question. Um, I mean, we can look at almost any hot button issue in, in our society today, and, and that's, we don't really think about what society needs. We think about, do I have the right to own a gun, or do I, don't I have the right to own a gun? I do have the right to own a gun, so it doesn't make any difference whether society would be better off if I didn't own a gun. I mean, the, you could go down the list. It was a, it was a very different time. I, you know, I hope I didn't I didn't intend to by any means oversimplify. There are lots of other things going on here, and one thing that's very fascinating about this era is that the German socialists were coming in at the same time. And I don't remember when Bismarck. Yeah, Bismarck was before this. I mean, they already had social security. They already had all this social stuff, and so. It was a very different um, social milieu. I mean, like the German, I'm sure those German factory workers at Pabst or Miller were like, don't we get a day off? What's going on here? Bismarck gave us a day off and we thought he was conservative. So, so there, there was a lot of things going on there that 
But again, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, if you look at that, that article about the state, or the university that runs the state, that was only Wisconsin. I mean, that would not have been written about any place else. And that had to be Van Heist and Baskin and LaFollette. Yeah, it went up here. I just thought I would state that Van Heist was horrified when that article came out. The one on? The university that runs the state. Oh, it was? It, it, he, he thought that was the worst thing that somebody could say, because that's not what they were trying to do. It was very much about encouraging self-governance, mm -hmm. not running a state. You know, it was about how can, we, how can we give you leverage so that you can run your state. If, if you, I, I didn't say anything about else about I'm getting feedback here. I didn't say anything else about that article except for the title. I read that article a couple of times, and it's like it's it's not well well written. Um, but yeah, I, I do think the Hubler article is really well written, and there are a few other things. The Stark article from the Blue Book talks a little bit about this, and then immediately goes into all of the agricultural progress, and and gives no credit to anything but. The, basically the college of Ag no they, they anyway but it's basically the, the agricultural progress at the time did I have a question over here yeah, well, what do you see as um, being well depending on if you want to come at it from a pro or a con perspective what do you see as currently being the biggest threats to the maintenance of this culture that underlies the Wisconsin idea or what do you think are a couple of actions that would best strengthen the well, you know, I actually did intend to mention that. Thanks for asking. Um, I think any weakening of the, and you know, even having the fact that I said it may give some people a target to weaken. But any weakening of the shared governance at the department level, um, even the student level. Um, I want my students empowered. I want them to think that they can change the world. Um, but the big thing that's already been changed, which will be um, the big thing, <laughs> the big thing will be the big thing, um, is, is electing a new chancellor and a pro president. And we've already lost that power. We, the faculty and staff, but principally the faculty, always had a majority of the committee to choose a new chancellor. And we always chose a chancellor. We didn't always choose well, but we always chose a chancellor who was an academic, had m administrative abilities, but certainly was an academic, and um, we thought had some hope for this culture. We could end up with, um, if Scott Walker hurries up and gets his bachelor's degree, we could end up with him as the new president. And, and no, but that's, to me, that's the big threat, is that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't see that most anybody's going to mess around with how the departments work, which I do think is the power of shared governance. But the uh, but the next chancellor and the next president could be could be a problem. Anything else? Well, no? you know, you have to do things to reproduce the culture. You can't. Uh, you have to actively do things to keep the culture alive. And there are many things, we, the bus trip, the, I think junior, I don't think we do good enough to, uh, at least at business school, of inculcating the junior faculty with this idea. And well, when you were speaking, I just, I wanted to get every one of my colleagues over here to hear this because they kind of know a little of this, but when you understand this, um, there's no place like this. There really, there really isn't. And I taught a lot of I mean, there's no, there's no place that gave faculty the respect. The, the in students, in staff, and that we were all collaborative in this, this effort. And if we, we have to do things actively. I think the, the people who founded this course over here, I think part of that was to revive this and 
to reproduce and uplift this group of people. And we need to do more of that. I, I agree. Um, you know, shared governance, like everything else, ebbs and flows. Uh, for the faculty, the, um, what the university committee is doing, which is the executive committee of the faculty senate. I also think the department chairs have an enormous role in um, inculcating this kind of thing. And um, yeah, I, but it's, I agree. I mean, you, you, we have to cultivate it and, and, and nurture it as opposed to, I don't, you know, I, I didn't want to by any means, and I don't think I did imply that it was history, but I think we should, we should actually recognize the history as opposed to just kind of cover it up and pretend that it's not there. Yeah? I, I have to admit, I, I'm, I'm struggling with um, the, the concept of the Wisconsin idea and then the concept of what uh, shared governance is uh, for faculty, for staff, for students at UW-Madison. I, and I'm holding to, I'm holding in conflict um, the concept of the Wisconsin idea helping the promotion, the creation of, of uh, communities understanding of, of true democracy, utilizing uh, the research and everything that, uh, that the university is able to, to provide and connect uh, to the community for self-governance. And then I think about you know, what, what is happening on our campus connected to shared governance, and I feel the disconnect. I, I remember early saying to uh, asking the question of Kathy Kramer after you know her research going mm -hmm. throughout the state and hearing about what do you think of UW Madison and hearing you know now that you've gotten to know me I'm going to tell you right. what I think about uh, UW Madison and the disconnect and I said she her, never asked them what they would have thought of their mother-in-law yeah she would have got the same answer um, but, but the, the, just just the final point um, I said. You know, your research allows you to do this. How many other faculty members have the opportunity? Does their research get them out into the community? Your research has gotten you to the United Nations. How many faculty members at UW-Madison get them into the community to have that relationship? Well, um, as many as wish to. I mean, people can do it if they want. Um, I was probably avoiding writing grants by going to the United Nation. Um, uh, but the point being that um, it's a university and we have to be a community of people and some of us go to the United Nation and some of us write major NSF grants that are gonna bring in hundreds of millions of dollars and we need to have all these parts. And one of the things that concerns me with kind of both your questions over here is that our new budget models aren't all that amenable to us being different. Um, we, we could spend a little bit more time with budget models. But the thing that I really want to get to the basis of your, of your point was, I don't really feel like I was doing the Wisconsin idea when I was with the United People. or the, I, was, I was doing more cooperative extension. I was doing what I like to do. Um, I really do define the, uh, the Wisconsin idea as, as public policy to, but the thing that I was really trying to connect and I, I tried to bring it together is all of this re represents, these are two pieces, maybe many pieces of the progressive era. Um, the shared governance and, and the way we're structured um, and, and then the Wisconsin idea. Um, I'm not saying that they're definitely ne necessarily exactly the same thing, but they're funded or fueled by that progressivism. And the reason I like that, um, uh, I think it was a Baskin quote, is what the what that progressive really progressivism really is about is if you provide the people with the tools, they will do good things. Whether they're faculty members or whether they're legislators or whether they're uh, now we've, we've been through times where people might disagree with that, but I really believe that that's what Bascom believed. It's like we'll educate them, we'll give them these. Uh, we'll ice, we'll send people down. Whatever we do, you you give the people the education and the tools, and everything will be fine. And um, that's what I think that optimism quote. I don't know that that was that was 
Hubler talking about Van Hy Van, uh, Bassett calling him an optimistic person, but I really think that's what it is. And I can tell you, having served for a long time as the faculty on the, on the university committee and also as a department chair, that the rules were written, by that rules I mean the faculty plus the procedures, were written assuming that everyone would be good. <laughs> and sometimes they're not. And when there's nothing in the rules that tells you how to deal with people who are not, it becomes a very thorny situation. And it's, the point I'm making is, is that it's very clear that the people who wrote that thought that everyone was going to be good. And um, yeah, sometimes people aren't good. Well, we're going to wrap this up saying, I'm going to just put one addendum to that. I think that one thing shared governance in the protection of tenure, et cetera, give you is insulation from the whim of the powerful to dictate who will be served. And if, if um, it allows the, the executive committee of departments, it allows people to decide about what they'll do research on and how they'll do it. Um, in the spirit of, to insulate them from the influence of the powerful who will tell them, this is who should be served, this is how they should be served. And this relates to your question about the class. Yeah. yeah, so I want to thank Bill again, Bill's the... Uh,